Well, welcome to the Speak With People podcast. My name is Jason Rates. I'm excited that you are joining us today. At Speak With People, we believe that our words matter and that healthy communication is oxygen for our relationships and our leadership. So whether you communicate one-on-one, on a team, from a stage, or from behind a screen, we hope this podcast encourages you, inspires you, and really challenges you to choose to communicate in healthy ways. Because we know when we do, your world, our world, my world will just be better and it will drastically improve our relationships and our leadership. Well, today I am so excited because we have an incredible guest on today's podcast and we're continuing our series, Becoming Great at Your Craft. If you love to communicate uh, from the stage, if you deliver tons of presentations, if you are a speaker who travels or a speaker who loves to do it, whatever, whatever place you are at, We're trying in this series to give some very practical ways for you to elevate and continue to grow your craft of communicating. So today we're going to ask questions about connecting with our audience. Are there secret skills that we can learn that can deepen those uh, connections? We're going to talk about, you know, are there habits that we need to figure out and getting to know our audience and how to truly connect. And so it's going to be a great episode. And we're joined by somebody that honestly, I, I've wanted to know for years. I've admired them from afar uh, and just love them. One of my favorite communicators on the planet. I've been in the audience many, many times as they have communicated. And I can tell you that they are just one of the best that I have ever heard. So I'd like to welcome Stuart Hall to the podcast. Welcome, Stuart. Thanks for being a part today. Jason, I am overwhelmed that you are that impressed with my ability to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> and I would like to say to your audience right now, prepare, ladies and gentlemen, to be underwhelmed with my presentation. <laughs> it is so good to be here, man. Thank you for asking. I'm honored. I love it. Well, hey, before we hop into the questions, uh, maybe we, you know, for our audience just to kind of get to know you a little bit more, maybe tell us a little about your story, who you are, what you do, family, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, best part about me is my wife, Kelly. She and I have been married for 31 years. Uh, She's the the greatest thing about me. We have three young adult children. Our son, Grant, uh, is 27. Um, Our daughter, Chandler, is 25. Youngest daughter, Cameron, is 22, who actually, both our daughters actually went to school, played sports at their respective colleges. Our uh, oldest daughter, Chandler, played basketball at Rollins College in Winter Park. And then uh, youngest daughter, Cameron, is just wrapping up her soccer career at the University of Florida. Oh, wow. Uh, that's the reason why who, I knew who Kyle Trask was earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm 34 plus years, uh, next generation ministry, have zero plans to do anything else. Kelly and I hope and pray that we can skid across the finish line with our hair on fire, believing in the next generation. And a ton of that time has, has been, for whatever reason, and still haven't figured it out uh, with me on stage speaking to teenagers. And then since 2008, um, I'm the director of student leadership for an organization called Orange, um, and also lead a couple of initiatives, influencer, leader, and captains as a part of that initiative. So live just north of Atlanta uh, in a little town called Buford that is exactly like it sounds. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. Well, that's fantastic. Well, today, you know, as we kind of dive into this idea of like really connecting with your audience, I wanted to just kind of start with this, like as you approach a speaking engagement or, you know, getting up in front of your audience, how do you prepare for that? Uh, Mm -hmm. Are there some things that you do to get to know your audience beforehand? Or, you know, is there like a checklist that you go through? You know, we'd love to just know what kind of goes into that. That's such a great question. I, you know, what's interesting is when I was younger, I think, my preparation basically ex- insisted of, uh, I get a chance to say something. <laughs> yep. And then I started, I started maturing and I started asking myself, do I have anything to say? Mm. Which is, I think is an in- incredible question. And now at 55 years old and having stood up on stages for 30 something years, I think the most important question I can ask is what is it that the host and what is it that the teenagers need to hear me say? Mm. It's not really as much about me as it is the audience. I think, yeah. I think it's flipped. It, when I was younger, it was very me focused. 
and now it's become extremely audience focused. Yeah. So the the primary question I am asking if I'm invited to speak somewhere by who whomever the host is is what is it that you need me to say or what is it that you want me to talk about? Um, and then for them to give me a snapshot, I think it's a mistake, Jason. Oftentimes we have what I call the white horse syndrome as communicators. We think we've been whether either hired or invited to ride in on a white horse and save the day and mm. expound some incredible exposition of, you know, if it's to faith community, some biblical truth or something that will inspire generations. And we forget that there, especially in faith communities, I have to keep this in mind all the time, that there are men and women who have been investing in teenagers for years. And I am simply there to help that kid take one step further yep. in becoming the best version of the person God created them to be. And if I'm not careful, I can actually destroy a ton of relational equity by saying something that's absolutely ridiculous just because I'm, I'm all up in myself. So yep. I think purpose is a big part of this. Like I love for a host to tell me, this is our theme. This is what I want you to talk about. Um, because it, then it allows me to know it, it's much easier to have a specific bullseye than it is for someone to tell you, this is the worst. Well, I just trust your heart. Well, you don't know my art. I mean, yeah, I could be really struggling, you know. Um, so once once the purpose becomes clear to me, then I'm asking, like, what is the universal tension that everybody feels about this thing? Mm. Um, as it, you know, for me, because I speak to a ton of faith communities, how do how do the scriptures and the person, example, and teachings of Jesus like speak to this? And then this is huge, like. I want teenagers and adults and parents and leaders and coaches to walk away being able to apply mm. something that I said. Like yeah. if they walk away and there's not any handles, which leads to another thing that's important. More times than not, Jason, with a talk or a, a series of talks, I'm I try to start at the end. Mm. Like how how am I handing this off? If a group of students are about to go into a small group with a small group leader, a, a, an adult who invests a ton of time in them, how do I best hand the baton off to that adult? And more times than not, the best way to hand it off is not to land the plane. The best way to hand it off is to level up the plane and then give the controls to the leader. Oof. And yeah. way too often as a communicator, I've made the mistake of, I feel like it's my job to land the plane. Yeah. And then they go in small group and they don't have a ton to talk about. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But because I've already solved the tension for them or I've, I've kind of brought home the point or here's the punchline. So I think that's a big deal. Um, I also want to bring most of my energy to whatever text. I, it The younger... When I was younger, my illustrations had so much energy because I had a funny story or a moving story or a dramatic occasion. And what I realized is that so much of my talk was front loaded mm -hmm. because I brought all my energy to some funny story and I wasn't really bringing energy to the very thing I wanted them to remember, the very yeah. thing I wanted them to apply, the thing that I wanted them to understand. Um, and then, you know, for me personally, I speak so often to the most anxious ADHD generation in the history of our country. Right. So if I am not constantly making transitions, moving from, you know, a movie clip to an illustration, to an object lesson, I have to constantly shift. Right, because because their attention spans are so small, and it's it's it just is so different. I remember, you know, ninety five first time that I'm hired to start standing in front of people, and you know, especially in faith communities, for the most part, kids they sit there, you know. And nowadays, you're just so right. Like, they're I mean, they're moving and they're going so quick to make that a, that a, you know that shift is just absolutely huge for communicators. Yeah. One last thing I would say to this yeah. question. Uh, 
someone a long time ago, I have never forgotten this, Jason. They said green rooms, green rooms are for people who need to feel important. Huh. I try as hard as I can, especially with teenagers. I am a 55 white has been athlete <laughs> who, who really never was. Yeah. There's nothing, there's nothing cool, relevant or sexy about me. <laughs> so I have to try as hard as I can to relationally connect to teenagers mm. before I walk on stage. Yep. So that just me having a conversation with a group of guys and complimenting their shoes or dude, do you play ball? Or what's the video game you guys are playing on your phone? Yep. I have immediate street cred and leverage when I walk on stage because more often times than not, they don't know I'm the communicator. Right. They just know when I walk on stage, they're like, oh my gosh, that was the dude that's speaking to us. So yep. I'm also fishing. I'm also fishing when I'm in the audience. Like, what school do you go to? What's your mascot? Who, you know, uh, I'll ask girls, who's the hottie on campus that I can make fun of in just a second when I get on you know, <laughs> stage? Um, things like that, that allows me to to hopefully gain some relational equity when I walk out yep. and start. Boy, that's so huge. I mean, you just took us, you know, to so many great places, you know, especially the difference between younger and older, you know, just starting off to more seasoned. You know, there's just this this crazy switch that happens, you know, and, and maybe I'm off. You can tell me. But, you know, when I was younger, boy, I, I, I was so me focused, just like you just talked about. I, I was hoping they would laugh at my jokes. And, you know, I put all of my energy into those illustrations because it's just it's just hilarious. You know, the story when I break my father in law's toilet, everybody laughs, you know. Right. But I. Right. And, and I, I'll never forget, you know, probably 15 years in walking through a student event and a youth pastor walked up to me and he's like, oh my goodness, you know, I attended this event when I was a kid and I remember that story about the bird. <laughs> yeah. And there's this moment yeah. where I'm like, okay, that's cool. But man, did you like, <laughs> yeah, did I, did I say anything remotely worthwhile? Right, <laughs> right, right. So just the wisdom of like where to, yeah, put your energy and resources, you know, to be able to but connect. But to encourage you, to encourage the younger you and to maybe uh, give therapy to the younger me, if a teenager remembers anything you said, yeah, you've done a, a, a pretty remarkable job. Yeah. Because yeah. let's let's think about the, if you've sat in a church service the last two months, do you remember anything your pastor said? Right. I mean, most of us can't. So the fact that a kid walks up to you and remembers a fart story is a, you know, you've, 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 you've moved the ball down the field a little bit. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's helpful. Very helpful. And it's, I know it's different for some communicators because there are some communicators listening who communicate to the same audience every single week. And that's a whole different, you know, I mean, a whole different ar arena when it comes to some skills. You have yeah. built trust, you've built time, you have, you know, history with them. No when you're walking into a brand new place, that's why I love, you know, this summer I'll, I mean, much like you, I'm 47 older guy, you know, not much cool about me. Uh, but you know, when I walk into summer camp the first day, nobody knows who I am. It, it's just a riot. You know, you ask some of those questions and knew that. And then by like day four or five, they're like, Oh yeah, you're, you're that guy, you're you that know, guy. Yeah. you're that guy, <laughs> you know, but to have, to have that. So, uh, so you talk, you gave us some great wisdom there, you know, uh, so pre stuff as you're, if as you're getting ready and you're planning for the event, is there anything that you're, you know, doing, thinking about when it comes to, you know, uh, your audience demographics or their interests or, you know, kind of assembling any of that kind of stuff? Well, I, you know, what's interesting in America is that I think psychographic are much more important than demographics today. I don't know why. And here, here's what I mean by that. You can have, especially with Generation Z, they're the most multiracial generation in the history of our country. And if you're not careful, you could look at an extremely diverse group of kids and assume that they all think differently. When in reality, there could be a lot of commonality wow. because of how multiracial they are. 
Now, it's probably a safe assumption to think And for your audience uh, race, for example, <clears throat> the U.S. Census says by the year 2045, if you are Caucasian in America, you'll be the minority. Wow. In, a, in the state of Georgia, it's 2030. In the city of Atlanta, we've already passed that mark. So as a middle-aged white dude to stand up in front of a diverse audience and assume just because I see diversity, uh, first of all, I need to assume that there's difference, but I also need to be aware of where is their sameness because Generation Z sees color and they celebrate it. Right. Our, the issue with multi-race as it relates to Generation Z isn't Generation Z. It's their moms and dads and their grandparents. Mm. So, so what I have to do then is to make sure, okay, what are the things from a demographic psychographic that I can uh, uncover before I get there? Uh, I do think there are some, some very... There are some things that I want to accomplish regardless of who's in the audience. Yeah. Um, I, I call it the Jimmy V principle. If you spend any time watching ESPN during Cancer Awareness Month, they will always replay this very famous speech by Jim Balvano, who died of cancer. The Jimmy V Foundation raises millions and millions of dollars for cancer research. And he, he gave this speech in one paragraph of his speech. Jason changed me forever because I think it should be a communicator's mantra. Mm. He said, he said, if you laugh, if you think, and you are moved, your emotions are moved every day. That's a full day. You have lived a full day. So when I communicate, I want to make people laugh. Yep. I want to make them think, and I want to move their emotions, regardless of what the demographic or psychographic is. The other thing I would say too and I learned this a long time ago, whatever I'm saying, I want to make it as clear as mud. Mm. Is it memorable? Is it understandable? And is it doable? Like, can they remember what I'm talking about? Do they understand what I'm talking about? And do they know how to apply whatever it is that I am talking yep. about? Um, yep. And then, and then determining what is the common denominator among all of us. So I'm like, a lot of times what I will do is I... I, I am, uh, notorious is not infamous is not the word. Maybe it's a rut, but I have, I get the hives when communicators walk out on the stage and they do a 10 minute presentation of who they are. <laughs> right. And I, and I don't mean to offend anybody that's watching or listening, because if that's your jam, rock on. But I am, kids do not care who I am. Unless I say something that moves them. Right. So I'm much more apt to start with a story or a one sentence that's a singer or yeah. a movie clip that immediately gets us all on the same page. So I don't have to spend any time going, my name is Stuart, here's my wife, and here's my kids, and you know, this is what we do for fun. And look how pretty yeah. my wife is. And all, I mean, it, <laughs> kids do not care. Yeah, what they care about is, am I going to be miserable for the next 30 minutes or is this dude going to help me laugh think and move my emotions so um you know and back to that diverse point i cannot communicate effectively to a diverse audience and with what with who i speak to more often than not it's extremely diverse because they're the most multiracial generation in the history of our country it is impossible for me to speak effectively to diversity if our dining room table isn't uh, diverse. Yeah. If my library isn't diverse. Yep. Um, and if I am not spending time understanding people that I am not like. Wow. Wow. Absolutely. Sorry. I'm yeah. passionate about this, so I apologize no. if it I love it. Off the top rope. <laughs> no, this is it's absolutely fantastic. Uh my my family, we uh, we had four of our own children and then we adopted a little boy from China and my, my wife's side, multiracial, they adopted, well, they fostered many, 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 many special needs babies. And then a fostered, they have fostered uh, and then adopted a, a Korean baby and then an African-American baby. And so 
you know, our families are just this, but it's, it's, it's just amazing when you do come across people who, who have not yet been entrenched in that yet to realize, oh, wait a minute, this is, this is where everything is going. This is, we've got to be able to understand, you know, where people are different. And that's just a huge, that's just a huge place you took us. I, I could not agree with you more, Jason. And I would even take it a step further. Even if the room is not diverse, I feel an immense responsibility to help them understand diversity. Yes. Because, and it's not just, I, I tell this story often, several summers ago, I was speaking at, there was 5,000 high school kids in, a, in an arena in Florida. Wow. I'm speaking and I just, I didn't even, I didn't even press the gas on the diversity issue. I just made mention of the fact that there are people in here, you are the anomaly in the room because you don't look like everybody else. And this blew me away. I got a DM less than 10 minutes after I walked off stage by a small group leader who was, he was a small group leader at one of the churches who was from Iran. Wow. He's a, he's an emergency room doctor, gave his life to Jesus years ago. And here's what he said, Jason. He said, it's the first time I've sat in any sort of Christian environment where I felt like I was seen. Huh. Part of our job as a communicator is to Every single person, if it's a, if it's a multiracial issue, if it's a sexual fluidity issue, I want you to know I see you. Yeah. And I care about you. I, I, have, a, I have a deep conviction about that because I think that's the kind of person Jesus was and is. And I have a deep conviction about that as a communicator because I want to make sure I can connect with as many people are, who are in the room. Yes. Yes. So that's a, that's a great place where you're taking us... Uh, there are few communicators who can speak to a room of 5,000, who can speak to a room of five, who, you know, everybody feels like, wow, they're really talking to me. You know, what, what do you think, how do you, how do you think a communicator gets to that place where mm-hmm. they're able to, you know, whether it's a small group, a large group, giant group, people still feel like it's personal and intense and real, you know, what goes into that? Cool. Uh, you know, one thing I would say immediately is I didn't start out speaking to 5,000 people. I, right. Like, I started speaking as a as a college athlete who had just started following Jesus, and my, uh, <laughs> I was the only Christian on our team, on our <laughs> college basketball team, and we would have FCA every Wednesday, and I would be the only person to show up. So he literally had no other choice, like, FCA become, became chaplain discipling Stuart because Stuart was the only guy to be there. <laughs> and, and then he, at the end of that year, was like, I think you should start telling your story. Mm. And so he would take me to these middle schools and high schools where there would be, you know, 15 kids at 7 o'clock in the morning because they were going to get a free Hardy's biscuit, you know. <laughs> and, and he will throw me up in front of them and go, go at it. And yeah. the thing that I remember him, someone saying is, you know, when you're in front of an audience of 15, you need to make it, you need to be as focused and as diligent as you would standing in front of 5,000 people. Yeah. And there are things that translate from the 15 to 5,000 that I don't think translate from 5,000 to 15. Yeah. Like it doesn't revert, it doesn't work in reverse. Like the need, the ability, like I even put this, when you send me the questions, I thought about, like, I ask every place that I go, can you turn the lights up mm. when I'm speaking? Because I want to see eyeballs and faces. Yes. And I know I, we're, we're in an overproduced time in our country, especially in faith communities. And I know so many production, you know, teams, they've spent so much time trying to make it look cool. I need to see faces and eyeballs. Yeah. yeah. Because I like... I just I just did an event, a parent event right outside of Detroit this past weekend, and the stage was like, I think the stage was almost five, almost six feet high, huh. and the closest table felt like it was 15 yards away from the stage, and I asked them, can you turn the lights up and can I come and stand down on the floor? Because I want to be able to see eyeballs and faces. Yep. Like you don't learn that if all you're ever doing is standing up in front of 5,000 people. Right. Um, so I think there is something to, uh, 
adults look like making eye t- contact with a kid. Yeah. Uh, there is something too. I think making eye contact with a kid many times will alleviate some of the people who are distracted or not are disengaged. Yeah. And not giving them the, you know, the stinky eye. You're not talking about, you know, <laughs> dude, you better, you know, I'm talking about just make eye contact with them. Uh, you know, being able to ask what's your name. Like if I'm telling a story and I try to make it first person story, like what's your name? If I ask Sarah, like, like that works with 15 kids and that works with 5,000 kids. Um, using a kid as an illustration, that same event I was talking about, I pulled a kid out of the audience that I probably should have pulled because it's, this dude's shorts. He's, <laughs> Um, I just want to say to all the young men out there, we used to call girls who wore short shorts hoochie mamas. There's some hoochie daddies out there now. And this <laughs> dude had on a pair of shorts that left nothing to the imagination. Oh, no. And I pull him up on stage and I realize I can't send him back because that'll be even more embarrassing. And he was like, damn. <laughs> but it, it endeared me to the room. Yeah. It endeared me to the room because he was laughing. I was laughing. You know, we would get, we would start giggling because of how ridiculous his shorts were. Um, but just those little things you learn over time, like those are things that connect you to the audience. Yep. And what it does is it just wins you relational leverage. Yes. Yep. Boy, that's so good. What? Well, take us to a time where, you know, the connection was just off. Like, you know, you're speaking, nobody is engaged. I mean, every, you know, uh, has, has there ever been a moment like that? How did you recover? You know, what did you do? Did you just chalk it up? You know, uh, tell us about any of those kind of times. There's too many, like the whole podcast can be. <laughs> any, any time I stand up in front of middle school students, I feel that way. Um, you know what? Uh, the most, one of the most recent ones, uh, I was at, I still don't know why they did this, but I was asked to speak. I did a, I did a student weekend at First Baptist Church, Montgomery, Alabama on MLK weekend. Hmm. If you don't know the history of Dr. King, like Montgomery is a big part of his story. Um, and they asked me to speak to the entire church, two services on Sunday. Wow, this Baptist Montgomery's pretty high church. Yeah, uh, organ choir. I hadn't been in a context like that in a long time, and most of the people. I mean, it's packed both services, but most of the people, especially in the first service, were not young. And I like I got nervous. It's the first time in a long time that I'm always nervous before I speak. Sure, but I'm like this is going to go over like a pregnant pole vaulter. It is not going to go well. Right. And Ugh. what I realized quickly, and the principle holds true with teenagers too, is don't pretend to be somebody that you're not. Ooh. Yes. So with students, for me to use words like dope and fire, and slay as a 55 year old white guy is dumb. Yeah. With adults, for me to not act like Kelly and I are the parents of a 27, 25, 22 year old. And in that particular instance, talking about uh, people's children and grandchildren and the, the, the impact grandmothers and grandfathers want to have on their kids. It was like ice melted. I, you could literally see it. Wow. And when I walked off stage after we were, there was a line. Huh. I, I got, I don't know how this woman did it, but a grandmother got our home address and sent me a card <laughs> and thanked me for one thing that I said in that talk I talked about on the other side of your view is a who. Uh. And because what, the older you are, you can have such judgment toward the next generation. But yeah. just remember on the other side of your judgment and your view of them is a who. Wow. So I, I think you're always going, 
the other thing too, I hope you take this the way I mean it. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. Right. Like I'm completely comfortable knowing, you know, where you and I met, uh, usually there's more than one communicator that week of camp and that's on purpose. Yeah. Because we know that I may not be able to connect with every kid. Right. And there's probably in every audience you speak to someone who just does not smell what you're cooking. Yep. And I got to be okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Um, it doesn't mean I, I failed. It doesn't mean I don't love that kid. It, I hate that we didn't connect. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I always think of it this way. I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but I can be somebody's shot of tequila. I can be, I can be somebody's like, oh, that woke me up. Um, and even if they didn't appreciate everything that I said, there was something that I said that connected. Oh, wow. Wow. That's good. And that will help so many young communicators because you really do want to be everybody's cup of tea until you, you get to that breaking point in that place. I love that. Hey, as our conversation kind of comes to a close, you, you've given us, man, I've, I've taken a couple. Yeah, sorry, I've, ta I've, I've talked too much. My no, it was great. I take a couple couple pages of notes. Any last, you know, lasting advice that you would give, you know, oh. newer communicators, younger communicators, you know, just about connecting with their audience effectively, you know, anything that you, you yeah, share kind of last. Couple, I would say a couple things. One, uh, as quickly as you can, discover your own voice. Boom. Oh. Become comfortable being you. Yeah. I, I t like, and I did it. Everybody does it. When I first started speaking, I would hear Tony Evans on the radio and I, I would be like, I'm going to yell at everybody. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be <laughs> that guy. And then I would hear a comedian and I'm like, you know what? No, I want to make everybody laugh. Yeah. And, and if you're not careful, the influences you sit under all the time, you actually start communicating like the people that you wow. sit under. Right. You listen to I think there's a danger in you always. That's why when I am asked, hey, who would you suggest that I listen to as a relationship become a better communicator? I always tell guys and girls, watch comedians. Don't watch preachers. Because <laughs> comedians comedians are the best communicators and they're the last prophets. Yeah. Because communication-wise, they're the best with transitions and they're the best in being able to say something that's really, really true, but it hurts too much to say it without using humor. Right. And they have, they have they have mastered the art of saying hard things so that we can take them. So, wow. all that being said, who are you? What who are you when like when you're speaking to people off stage? Our son, when he was really little, we were flipping through the channels and a TV preacher came on a television, and this dude was just sweating and you know spitting. And Grant, our son, looked at me because Dad, do you think that dude talks like that in real life? <laughs> and what he was really saying is when he walks off stage, is that who he is? Mm. This is a great question for young communicators. Do you become a different person when you walk off stage or walk on stage? Right. Right. Like the, the greatest leverage you have is the same person you were on stage is any, an even better version of you when you walk off stage. So I don't want my voice changing, my inflection changing. But all that is a result of you discovering who you are and just be the best version of you. You don't yeah. need to be some other, you know, Stephen Furtick, Judah, wh whomever. Right. Be you. Right. Um, two more things quickly. One, the other one is, uh, I call it the Chihuahua versus St. Bernard principle. Uh. Uh, as it relates to your cadence, and tone. I I hear a lot of communicators, especially when they're younger, they step on stage and they're already in fifth gear and they stay in fifth gear. Wow. Yeah. And what winds up happening is the audience becomes emotionally exhausted because your tone and your cadence is like. <laughs> If you ever been around a Chihuahua, that's a Chihuahua. It's like <laughs> it's just always yapping. Yep. Saint Saint Bernard, on the other hand, you rarely hear a Saint Bernard bark. Right. But when they bark, everybody's like, "What was that?" Yep. 
if you're not careful and it's and it is really from your passion and because you're excited you can be a chihuahua when you need to be a saint Bernard. yeah like learn how to shift gears yeah sometimes you need to start a talk in fourth shift to fifth go down to first i mean it's a constant yep 15 years last thing i would say is do not people especially teenagers People get exhausted by effort. Huh. If you're trying too hard, the place that I see it often with young communicators is pacing. There, there's a ton of pacing. Yep. And again, you do it in the name of passion. But before long, regardless of whether you're passionate or not, it gets translated as you're either nervous or you're trying too hard. Right. So you're better off and this bleeds into the Chihuahua St. Bernard principle. You're better off anchoring yourself and thinking oscillating fan uh, versus I'm going to pace all the time and everybody's going to get dizzy watching me move. And then as you're pacing all the time, you're also becoming like a Chihuahua because there are times when you become an oscillating fan, what winds up happening when you do need to make a point that's incredibly powerful. Right now I have reserved the right to take a couple of steps and make an emphatic point and people pay attention, right? You're doing this all the time, right? They don't pay attention because they've become exhausted by your movement. Those would be my three. Ooh, boy, those are, uh, those are so rich and so helpful. And, uh, Stuart, I just know this conversation will help and, uh, provide just a lot of, <laughs> a lot of depth and resources to many communicators. So, Thank you so much. Hey, before we let you go, I thought we'd just ask you some uh, rapid fire questions, just a little bit more about yourself as we uh, we kind of finish up. But um, fire away, fire away. So, do you have a favorite, you know, guilty pleasure TV show that you're you're watching? Right now? Uh, Your Honor with Brian Cranston on HBO. Okay, Your Honor and Dear Edward. Dear, I don't know if you've seen those two shows. Your Honor blows Kelly's and my socks off. Huh. Unbelievable drama. Set in New Orleans, Brian Cranston is a judge. I, I don't want to tell you about it. But yeah, Your Honor, love I love it. it. Okay, is today Friday? Today is Thursday. Today is Thursday. Tomorrow it comes out. The next. Okay. Thursday, so. Okay. Good. Oh, interesting. Question two: uh, If you're a podcast person, is there one that kind of your go-to right now? Uh, I am a huge Adam Grant fan, so rethinking mm, yeah. with Adam Grant, and also a Malcolm Gladwell fan. So I love revisionist history with Malcolm Gladwell. And rethinking with Adam Grant. Awesome. Last question. Uh, I mean, you know, being from the motherland there, are you more of a Chick-fil-A person? Do you occasionally go over to Zaxby's or PDQ? Or do you you stick with, you know, are you faithful with the, with the Chick-fil-A? If my only two choices are fast food fried chicken, <laughs> which at my age I should never put in my body, <laughs> uh, it would be Chick-fil-A. But probably because I ate Zaxby's. You ever done this like you ate something and you got sick and from that point on you can't eat it anymore? Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. That happened to me with me with Zaxby's and consequently I can see it and get nauseous. <laughs> it's well, a refle- if you're here, if you're watching and you work with Zaxby's, it's not a reflection on your food. <laughs> I just have a stomach bug. <laughs> Well, goodness gracious. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Tell us where people can find you online. What's the best place to, you know, get more of your resources yeah. and things. My, uh, my social media handles, I am on Twitter and Instagram. I'm not on Facebook. Because that's a dumpster fire. I don't know. Twitter's not much better. Um, it's, it's very narcissistic. It's I am Stuart Hall, at I am Stuart Hall, and Stuart is spelled S-T-U-A-R-T. And if anybody has a question or comments and want to direct them directly to me, I am Stuart at me.com. You can email me. there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again for being a part. So appreciate this. And thank you for joining us on this week's episode of the speak with people podcast. Again, if you are looking for a help coaching, you just need you know, to that next step to improve your communication Thank you for heading to the speakwithpeople.com website. You'll find information about our coaching and our training on there. Again, appreciate every time you listen, you download, 
the podcast. It means the world. Lastly, uh, this podcast exists because words matter and we believe healthy communication is oxygen for your relationships and your leadership. So whether you communicate one-on-one on a team, from a stage, or from a screen, we hope that this time challenged you, encouraged you, inspired you to choose to communicate in healthy ways. We know that it will improve your world for the better. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week.